I want you to imagine today an island where all students learn about science by doing science. I want, you to, I want you to imagine an island where every adult, regardless of their profession, has helped with some discovery. I want you to imagine an island where we consider the world to be a question that each person struggles to help answer in better and better ways each day. So I started to think about an island like this one when I was writing my first book, Every Living Thing, about biological discovery. And one of the themes that comes up again and again in this book is the idea that we tend to think that we know most of what can be known, that we live in this egg of knowledge around which there's a patina of unknown. And again and again in the history of science, what happens is that that egg breaks, breaks open and we're proven to be far more ignorant than we think that we are. And one of the stories that, that for me is most conspicuous in this regard is the story that starts with this guy, Carl Linnaeus, the father of taxonomy and of naming life. And, and Linnaeus wanted to think about how many species there might be on Earth. And he estimated that there might be as many as 12,000, <laughs> which, which now seems silly, right? But, but what was silly in a way more so than the estimate was that what he did was to project a little beyond what he knew. And what happened through time is that we discovered more and more species, but what didn't change is that we always, in thinking about how many there might be, projected a little beyond what we knew. And so by the time that 1980 came, we had about a million species that were named on Earth. And when scientists were asked, how many could there be in total? People would do what Linnaeus did and say, eh, a little bit more. How about 1.2 million, 1.4, maybe 1.5? And then this guy, Terry Irwin, comes along. He's a tropical beetle biologist, and he's going to the forest, and he's fogging trees, and beetles are falling in his hair, down his shirt, into his underpants, and everyone seems to be a new species. <laughs> and, and so he starts to think, well, how many species of beetles could there really be? And so he does a radical thing. The first person ever to do this he tries to actually calculate how many species there might be on Earth. And in one version of his calculations, he comes up with the number 100 million. And this is ludicrous, right? Because what it means is that 99% of what's out there living is unknown. And so what happens predictably is that a bunch of grumpy scientists write and say, you're clearly wrong, Terry, and they argue for a while. And the grumpy scientists come to the conclusion that the number could be as low as 8 million, which is to say, still 7 out of 8 unknown. And then the whole field just stops. And my sense of why that whole field of inquiry, trying to figure out how many species there are, stops, is because what everybody realized is that we're still too ignorant to know. We don't yet know enough for these estimates to be reasonable, so people stop trying. And so what they instead started to try to do was to estimate the number of species in a particular place by actually going and looking for them. And so there was a project in the rainforest in Costa Rica. There was a project in the Great Smoky Mountains. There was a project in Sweden, possibly the least diverse place on Earth. <laughs> no, I, I don't mean that as a negative, it's just biologically that's true. Um, <laughs> And so in each of those places, people go to try to find all the species, and each time they fail. And the extent of this failure is emphasized by our daily lives. So if you go out into any city you live in, any town, and look in your backyard, nobody can tell you even approximately how many species are in your backyard. Nobody can tell you even approximately how many species live in your house. Nobody can tell you even approximately how many species live on your body right now. And so this is an amazing thing. For me as a biologist, it's thrilling because it means I can go anywhere and discover cool things. What a great job, right? The, the darkness that surrounds us, the darkness of the unknown is tremendous and our light is humble and so we go forth. But the other thing about this is that it's terrifying. As an individual living in a body, the landscape that I look out on, the landscape that I think about is one in which most of the species we depend on for sustenance. Most of the species that might be useful medically, most of the species that can kill us, don't yet have names. And so as we think about that, we should greet it with some kind of terror, right? And so we imagine looking back on the explorers of old, and when we do, we look at their boats and we think they go off into the unknown. But the reality is that every morning when you wake up, you go out into the biological unknown. Everything you touch, your lover, the doorknob, anything you touch outside is mostly covered in species we know nothing about. 
How could this be, right? What do we do? So what we've done in my group at North Carolina State University, the Your Wildlife group, is to start to engage other people in helping us to study these realms. Because we've proven that scientists on our own, we can't do it, there's too much. And so we do what's called citizen science or public science. And as an emblematic story of what, you do, what we do, I want to tell you the story of this cricket. It's a camel cricket, lots of people don't like them, but they live in houses. And one day in our group, we decided to send an email to see who had these crickets in their houses. We send an email and people start to respond via their phones and tablets and everything else. And, and what we expected was that this cricket would be almost everywhere in North America. And the amazing thing <laughs> is that in one day we get this map. In one day, 500 people have very quickly responded. And this map shows us that something's wrong. The red dots in this map show where people say they have these crickets. The white dots where they don't. And this doesn't correspond in any way to what we predicted and what we know about these crickets. And so we thought, well, maybe people are seeing roaches and thinking they're crickets or mice, or they're just getting scared in their own basement and not looking. <laughs> and, and so we say, send us a picture, because everybody's got their cell phones. And so people sent pictures. And lo and behold, what we found was that people were not seeing the native camel cricket we expected, but this giant Japanese camel cricket that nobody had realized had spread basement to basement across eastern North America. We think it now numbers in the tens of millions and nobody noticed it and all it took was an email and cell phones. And so this is our model for how we move forward to understand our world. There are the cricket sized things lurking in us, in it. And, and so we've sent kids out to backyards to look for ants and in doing so we found three new species of ants on Broadway in Manhattan. We've gone with families into their houses looking for animal species, and we expected tens of animal species, and we find hundreds in the average house, thousands across houses, most of which we know almost nothing about. And then the most exciting thing is we gave people swabs and said, swab your house, and we'll look at the DNA in those swabs and see what's living there. And when we did, we found tens of thousands of kinds of microbes, mostly new to science, and we found 86,000 kinds of fungus in houses, more kinds of fungus than are named on earth. <laughs> and so this for us is incredibly exciting. <laughs> but science should know no bounds, and so we've gone where others have not been bold enough to go, including the belly button. <laughs> and so we had people sample their belly buttons, and we know that the species living on your skin and in your belly button they protect you from pathogens. They're your first layer of defense. If you cleared them off, you would die from an infection. We just don't know which ones. And so we are finding thousands of species in belly buttons, species we know nothing about. But it's not just the species of microbes on our bodies. We've also started to look for animals. And when we did, we found this creature. This is a forehead mite. We've now discovered by working with the public that 100% of adults have them all over their body. We know very little about them other than that they mate on your head when you're sleeping. They don't have an anus, and so when they fill up, they explode. <laughs> so sorry. Look, biology's hard, right? Um, and, we, and I don't think they're deadly. I think maybe they're useful, but we don't actually know. And they're on all of you. And, and so this is where we're going. It's incredibly exciting. But to me, the most exciting part about this is we can bring it to schools. And so all of the things that we do with the public, we can do in classrooms. We can teach students about science by doing science. And this is important because the way we teach students about science today... The way we teach them about science today is the same way we taught in the dark ages. Somebody holds open a book and reads, and the students look for what they've been told about. That is literally what we did in the dark ages. How about instead we teach students that somebody holds up, open a book and reads, and they look at something about the world, and they look for what we don't know. That's possible. And it's possible in a way that wasn't possible several generations ago, several decades ago, because of the powerful tools we all have in our pockets. 
We can now connect classrooms with these amazing computers. We can use these computers to look out. We mostly use these to take selfies. <laughs> but what if we turn them around and use them to take otheries? I think that the light that these tools offer us is incredible if used wisely. The light that they offer us allows us to think about an island, an island that is the whole earth. When we look at a map like this, we mostly th think about the horror of the fact that we're so dense on the planet. These are our lights at night, but these are also the lights of our ingenuity, the lights of our curiosity, and they're the places where we can shine a light directly on the place we live and understand more about it. And so let us comprehend this island as a question. What Terry Irwin, the biologist, showed us is that we all wake up in the darkness of our own ignorance. But what I believe is that together with our humble lights, these humble lights, that we can look out and at the end of each, each day see more together than we could ever see at the beginning on our own. Thank you. Thank you.